So thank you, Claudia, for the presentation, and thank you very much to the organizer for this nice the invitation to this nice place. Today, I would like to discuss with you how to construct Hadamard state in case of a gauge theory. And in particular, I will focus on Maxwell theory. And then the key idea for constructing Hadamard state will be try to fix completely the gauge degrees of freedom. So for the one of you that are not familiar for a gauge theory, don't worry, let me recap what it is. So the idea is that uh, we are going to work on a four dimensional manifold that is global hyperbolic. So roughly speaking, it's just a Cartesian product between the real numbers and uh, a manifold, a smooth manifold sigma, and the matrix take this form here. Where now H is just a one parameter family, smooth parameter family of Riemannian metric, and beta is a smooth function that is positive. A gauge theory can be seen according to Ack and Schenkel as a quadruple, where the first two data are just a Hermitian bundle, so let's say a real or complex vector bundle of finite rank over the manifold M that determines which kind of fields you would like to study. The dynamics of your fields is instead understood as the kernel of a differential operator acting on the section and the vector bundle we want to itself. And we are going to assume this uh, operator P to be formally self-adjoint. We will not ask to be hyperbolic, so in principle the Cauchy problem might be not well posed or even difficult to discuss. To overcome this problem that P is in general not hyperbolic, like for example the Maxwell operator seen as uh, the composition between the co-differential and the differential or the linearized Einstein equation, we are going to look for some uh, operator K that acts from the section of the bundle V0 to the section of the bundle V1, of course, has to be different from zero. And we are going to say that the, the, the range of the operator K sits in the kernel of the difference of the operator P. In this way, we can interpret the operator key as a, a gauge transformation. So uh, the range of this operator here models all the possible gauge transformation of the theory. And uh, as a benefit, we can introduce then two differential operator, P1 acting on the section of V1 to, to, to itself, and D0 acting on the section from D0 to itself. And we are going to ask them to be both green hyperbolic. So namely, I would like to ask that uh, uh, there exists advanced retardant green operator for D1 and D0. Since I have assumed that the, different, the differential operator P is formally self-adjoint, one can show that actually also the one in D0 is formally self-adjoint. And green hyperbolicity can be also understood as Cauchy hyperbolicity. So namely, the Cauchy problem for D1 and D0, once I assign a nice class of initial data, is well posed. So since the Cauchy problem of D1 and D0 is well posed, we can equivalently work at the level of initial data that it will be more convenient for later in the construction of the Hadamard state. And to this end, let me introduce some notation. So I'm going to call uh, V row one, the bundle of initial data for uh, the DI operator. And again, I assume to be uh, an Hermitian bundle. So I'm, I'm going to have a fiber metric on V and I'm not going to ask this fiber metric to be positive definite, nor the fiber metric on v, v, uh, V0 and V1 has to be in general positive definite. So working on the initial data, we have to understand what they are the, the gauge transformation on the level of initial data. So to this end, since uh, the operator di has a well post Cauchy problem, I can introduce uh, two maps that are uh, the Cauchy data maps and the Cauchy evolution operator that are the inverse of each other. And I can define as K sigma just the action of K restricted to the level of initial data. So I take some initial data, I evolve it, then I map, uh, I map K from uh, gamma V0 to gamma V1, and finally I take the restriction to the initial data for uh, D1. Analogy, uh, in a similar manner, I can also define the action of K star at the level of initial data Again, sandwiching with the Cauchy evolution operator for U1, for D1, and the Cauchy data map for D0. 
And since I have assumed that uh, these two operators are green and parabolic, I can in particular define an operator that I will call a causal propagator that characterizes uniquely the kernel of D0 and D1. And uh, as for K and K star, I can also define the action of this causal propagator at the level of initial data. So this operator here, that I will call as GI sigma, will represent some form of a symplectic form acting on the left acting on uh, initial data. So the, this is just a classical theory. So the question is how we want to quantize it, so. Sure. Exactly, so this is the difference between this uh, retarded and advanced screens operator. I mean, depends what you call advanced and retarded. Um, okay, how we want to quantize it. The idea is to proceed in two steps. In the first step, we would like to understand the classical theory, and then to this classical theory, we want to assign a unique abstract to our algebras, and then we want to construct, we rec recover some probabilistic interpretation, and or in particular, define some representation of this abstract algebra on some Hilbert space. So maybe in more detail, when you have a gauge theory as a set, the kernel of operator P is quite tough to study, and you just want to study modulo a gauge transformation, so the range of the operator k. And uh, according to this uh, setting of Ak and Schenkel, it's easy to see that this quotient space can be actually understood as uh, this other quotient space. So we have uh, an hyperbolic operator, now d1, and we want to study the Cauchy problem that is actually constrained. So we are going to ask any solution of the this operator here, that in practice can be thought as a wave operator, for example, has to satisfy an extra condition. From a physical point of view, this means that you are studying a particular solution in uh, a specific gauge. Of course, choosing just uh, asking that the solution of this hyperbolic Cauchy problem is also a solution of K star, does not uh, fix completely the, uh, the range of K, and so we still have some quotient here. We can also, since this is an hyperbolic uh, Cauchy problem, we can thought to this Cauchy space just at the level of initial data. So we take any initial data that are good for the uh, one, so just smooth initial data. And in particular, in order to, to be also in the kernel of K star, we are going to ask that this initial data has to be in the kernel of a K sigma dagger. And again, all this space has to be understood uh, up to some gauge transformation, and this is exactly the role of K-star. So since these are isomorphic, these two spaces are isomorphic, one can show that actually also this space here is isomorphic to this space here, simply because you just take uh, a function that is completely supported, a section, sorry, then you apply the causal propagator and you end up almost by definition in the kernel of D1, and if you just restricted uh, the space of section that are also in the kernel of K-star, then you can also satisfy the later condition. So this is again always modulo some gauge transformation, and, uh, and therefore also these two spaces are isomorphic. So I will define this space here as the classical phase space, once is endowed with, with this Hermitian form, where G1 is just the causal propagator of T1, and then since uh, all the arrows are isomorphisms, in particular there exists also an isomorphism between the phase space and this phase space of the initial data. And I'm going to define some uh, charge or some symplectic Hermitian form, Q1 sigma, on this space here, such that this map here is also unitary. So I don't want to modify the charge of your theory. So understood the classical phase space, it just uh, to construct an algebra, we just define it abstractly. So we, to define abstractly, we define by generators and relation. So to any element in the phase space, we assign a possible generator where this is the identity in the algebra. And then we define also some suitable uh, commutation relation and uh, that recover the, the behavior of your quantum theory. So once you have an abstract algebra, so you want to find the representation and this is, can be done just considering linear and positive functional that are called state from the algebra to the complex number. And in this talk, I will also focus on a suitable class of state that are called quasi-free. 
So namely, to define a state will be sufficient to consider a pair, lambda plus and lambda minus, defined of, of, uh, with the state, that I will call covariances. So not all state can be considered physical, and uh, a possible physical criteria is the so-called Hadamard condition. So if you just consider the Schwarz kernel of, this, of the covariance, you are going to ask that the, wave, the prime wave from set is contained in n plus plus minus times n plus minus, where these are just the connected component of the, no, of the uh, light cone. Yes? Pardon? Uh, okay, in, the, in, the, uh, in this formal level, it's not supposed to be injective, but uh, the practical level, you won't. So how do we want to characterize these covariances here? Because again, working in space-time is quite tough. So maybe there, are, there is a nice uh, characterization given by Christian Gerard and Michal Vrokna that tell us that as soon as you construct an uh, operator a couple of operators, C plus minus, acting on the space of initial data that satisfy this bunch of hypotheses here, then you can immediately define some pseudo covariances of a quasi free Adama state. So we are going to ask that this operator here preserves uh, the are invariant under gauge transformation and they are uh, self adjoint with to respect the charge they have to sum to the identity in order to be compatible with the canonical commutation relation. And uh, of course, to get uh, a representation of Hilbert space, we also need uh, some uh, positive scalar product. And so we are going to ask that when you plug C plus minus in the charge, you get something positive. Of course, you don't want to get, I mean, ideally we would like to get something positive in the whole Hilbert space or for all section, but this is not the case for gauge theory. So we just re res restrict this requirement of getting something positive uh, on the kernel uh, of k dagger sigma, so just on uh, observables. And finally, the, con the Adamar condition can be just rephrased using the Cauchy evolution operator applied to this C plus and minus. So they are called pseudo covariances exactly for the reason that the positivity is only required on uh, observables so on something that is in the kernel of K dagger star, the dagger sigma. And uh, what are the difficulties in constructing the state? So differently for us, Dirac fields or scalar fields, usually the fiber metric is not positive definite. So this condition here is quite difficult to achieve, even when we, also when we restrict it to this uh, space here. And the construction, uh, the usual construction with C plus minus done uh, by Christian and uh, Michal with the pseudo differential calculus works extremely well with the Adamar condition, but unfortunately interact quite badly with the gauge invariance and also the positivity. So my proposal is going to, is the following. I am going to fix all gauge decrease of freedom and I will try to construct the C plus minus, modifying the method of uh, Christian and Michal that uh, work quite good on linearized uh, mills. So in the talk, uh, will be divide, my talk will be divided in five parts. In the first part, I will explain which kind of a gauge I'm going to study in order to fix uh, the, all the, the gauge degrees of freedom. And uh, once we understood what is this gauge here, I will define uh, a suitable space of form that I'm calling uh, Hodge decomposable, where this gauge can be actually achieved. Once we restrict it to this space here, then it will be not too difficult to show that this is a complete gauge fixing, and then we will study, study the phase space. Finally, since we want to construct another mass state, then uh, we will uh, uh, try to understand better the space of Hodge decomposable data in this Cauchy radiation gauge, we will try to get uh, an explicit uh, characterization because this will help us to construct another mass state. So maybe important to remark that this is actually a joint product with my PhD student, Gabriel Schmidt. So 
So if you have any time, interrupt me in any moment. So we have discussed it abstractly what should be a gauge theory. Now let's just check some the example of Maxwell. So in the Maxwell, we have two vector, two complex vector bundle. The first one is V1, where the section are going to be just uh, one complex smooth one forms, and we end up the vector bundle V1 with the odd inner product. You can see that this odd inner product, since the metric here is Lorentzian. Is in the fiber metric is Lorentzian, is in general not positive definite. And uh, the gauge transformation will be labeled again by just a complex value smooth function. So the operator that implements the dynamic can be understood as uh, the composition between the differential operator and its adjoint with respect to the Hodge inner product that is called the co differential. The operator k that implements the gauge transformation are just a differential, and therefore k star is the co-differential. We can see immediately that if you define d1 as p plus uh, k k star, we get uh, a normal hyperbolic operator, so a wave-like operator, and uh, acting on one form. And similarly, d0 is also going to be hyper a normal hyperbolic operator acting just on scalar function. Since the kernel of the Maxwell operator is invariant under conformal transformation, I can just uh, assume my metric to be given in this form here. So where basically the, the, the smooth function beta is just uh, reabsorbed in an effective uh, Riemannian metric H of t. So the gauge I want to study is uh, the Cauchy radiation gauge. So why Cauchy? Because uh, I'm going to ask, uh, as for example, in the case uh, of the radiation gauge, where I assume the temporal gauge A0 and the Lorentz gauge, I'm going just to ask uh, that a field is satisfied the Lorentz condition, so the divergence of this field is zero, and then instead to ask that uh, in this decomposition, the Taylor component is zero is zero, I just ask that its initial data are going to be zero. Of course, if this manifold is ultrastatic, so namely this, uh, the Riemannian metric does not depend on time, then uh, the Cauchy radiation gauge is equivalent to the radiation gauge because I can decouple the Maxwell equation and then this, uh, this initial condition propagates and tell me, and tell me that uh, A0 is identically zero. In particular, also in ultrastatic spacetime, this radiation gauge can also be seen equivalently as the temporal gauge plus uh, the Coulomb gauge. So, of course, this operator here is a bit, is a, in ultrastatic spacetime is the same, but this is simply more general in, in a global hyperbolic manifold because in general, these two gauge cannot be achieved. What is nice of this gauge here is that uh, the, the fiber metric that is just defined using the d minus dt par plus h minus one becomes strictly positive because uh, if you define on the level of initial data, these two are zero, and therefore also in ultrastatic space time, also these components can be dropped. So fixing the gauge decrease of freedom in this case already solves the problem of the positivity of the Hermitian of the fiber metric. Okay, but then the question is, uh, when can be achieved the Cauchy radiation gauge? And to this end, I have to introduce two different spaces. So the first space I will call space of Hodge decomposable K form that is just defined in, in this way here. And if assume sigma to be just uh, compact, then this space here is, is the same, is the space of all uh, as, uh, K, smooth K form, uh, complex valued K form sigma by the Hodge decomposition. So what uh, it prevents me to define, uh, a Hodge, since I cannot define a Hodge decomposition on an open menu, on an open Riemannian manifold sigma, then I'm just uh, requiring my form uh, to have some sort of Hodge decomposition. So it should be the, given by the sum of, an, uh, of a completely supported function that is in the range, uh, oh, sorry, completely supported K form that is in the range of D sigma, plus something that is in the kernel of delta sigma. So this is going to be useful for the class of initial data, 
And then clearly, since I have, I'm restricting the class of initial data, I'm going to restrict also the class of solutions. So I will introduce, or I will introduce the space of variation K form, simply saying that you have a, a K form with K strictly greater than zero, then the restriction of its spatial part, so given in this way here, is odd decomposable. So if you just think to uh, one form where it can be decomposed to, let's say, omega zero dt plus d sigma, so I'm going to ask that d sigma is in this space here. So what is nice in the introduction of this space is that uh, the Hodge Laplacian acting on uh, just functions, modulo, uh, complex, modulo constant function, is actually bijective in the range of del delta sigma. So I can invert uh, the Hodge Laplacian. This is, will be important in order to achieve uh, this Cauchy gauge, uh, the Cauchy gauge radiation. <coughs> radiation. Let's see how. So let's assume that uh, we are in globally hyperbolic and uh, manifold is given in this form here without losing of generality. Then I can say that for any of one form in this uh, radiation, sorry, in any radi radiation one form A, for any radiation one form A, there exists uh, a function, a complex function F, such that uh, A prime satisfies the Cauchy radiation gauge. How? I simply I decompose again A as uh, in this way here, using the splitting of my manifold. And then uh, uh, the re requirement that A prime satisfy the Cauchy radiation gauge is actually equivalent to solve this problem here. And you see immediately that uh, since uh, we have the introduced these odd decomposable uh, forms and the radiation forms, uh, then uh, the Hodge Laplacian is invertible, and we can find a unique function f satisfying this hyperbolic uh, equation. Um, therefore, since we can find a unique f uh, that plug a, a prime in the Cauchy radiation gauge, we can see immediately that uh, we have fixed all uh, uh, gauge decrease of freedom. Indeed, we can show that uh, the space of a solution of the Maxwell equation actually restricted to this radiation gauge, modular gauge transformation is isomorphic to the solution of this wave equation that are also divergence free and, and the initial data are just the one that uh, are zero for A0 and pi zero. Okay, then uh, since uh, we have fixed uh, so we have understood that this space here is actually isomorphic to this space here via gauge fixing. And uh, we know that uh, this, the Cauchy problem for D1, uh, again, is well posed. We can find uh, some uh, phase space at the level of initial data, just asking that the initial data satisfy not only some sort of Lorentz condi gauge condition, but also the, the temporal part has to be zero. So since these two spaces are isomorphic and this space is isomorphic to the previous one, we can exactly define uh, a map, a unique isomorphism, T sigma, from the uh, space of initial data to the space of this initial data that satisfies this uh, radiation condition. So maybe introducing some notation, I, call, I will call uh, this uh, VR as the space of Hodge decomposable uh, data in the Cauchy radiation gauge. Clearly, since we have restricted uh, the possible solution of the wave equation, then also uh, the phase space is going to be restricted. And I will have to ask that uh, the, actually the function f are, are given in such a way that when we apply g1 to a, this is, is, is a radiation. So this solution of the Cauchy problem give some initial data that are again Hodge uh, decomposable. To conclude the classical theory, we are now left uh, to endow the, the, the space uh, of Hodge decomposable data in the Cauchy radiation gauge with some suitable Hermitian forms. So to this hand, we just, uh, we again use the, the canonical splitting of this one form in these two parts here 
And then we define, uh, the, Cauchy, we define the Cauchy data map for D0 as rho zero that assigned to any function f its restriction to the Cauchy surface and uh, the time derivative on the Cauchy surface restricted to the Cauchy surface. And on rho one, uh, we decided to split uh, in this way. So we assign the initial data for A zero, so the restriction of A zero to sigma and the time derivative to sigma, as well as uh, the initial data for A sigma. So we just take A sigma and restrict it to sigma and then we take the time derivative of a sigma and we restrict it to sigma. We know that the by construction, this isomorphism here was actually unitary because we have defined it P1 sigma in order to make this map unitary. And uh, if you try to compute exactly how this uh, G1 sigma or P1 sigma looks like and represented on the respect, with respect to the Hermit fiber, uh, Hermitian forms on the space of initial data, you find out this form here. And you can see immediately that this is going to cause some trouble. So this is exactly the troubles coming from uh, the fact that the fiber metric was not positive definite. So well, now we have fixed the initial data. We have this unique map T sigma, and we want to construct a uh, uh, a form, uh, an Hermitian form, uh, on the space of all decomposable initial data, such that this map is unitary. And you see, when you try to construct this map here, it's simply taking this uh, this operator here, and you restrict it on this class of initial data because this is identically zero. So what you're doing practically are just killing uh, this upper part of this matrix here, and then you end up with some. Uh, fiber metric that is positive definite. So summing up, we have constructed some unitary isomorphism from the classical phase space to the phase space of initial data, and then to the phase space of odds decomposable initial data in the Cauchy radiation gauge. The only price to pay to this moment is just that for a manifold, for a global hyperbolic manifold with an uncompact Cauchy surface, we have to restrict the class of uh, of solution, initial data and then of solution. While, while if the Cauchy surface sigma is compact, there is no loss of generality. So this is the classical theory. And then the next goal is to construct the state. Of course, if you want to construct a state, you also want to know in a more explicit manner how it looks like this isomorphism here. Because as soon as you construct a state, you can pull back along this isomorphism, but the pullback uh, might destroy any Hadamard condition we have achieved at this level here. So we really need an explicit expression in order to be sure that when we will pull back the state, also the Hadamard condition is preserved. So to this end, uh, we have to characterize, unfortunately, T sigma. And let me just recall that T sigma, by definition, the range of T sigma coincides exactly with the odds decomposable initial data, so our initial data that uh, the, the time component is zero and they satisfy some Lorentz gauge. And we want the kernel of T sigma just to be the range of K sigma. So with this condition, basically, we are also sure that the, key, the, the, the um, state we are going to construct is going to preserve, uh, is going to be gauge invariant. Okay, how do we want to compute? So we are trying the following answers. So we just act with our sigma, and then we have to find that is defined in, in a very general space on any initial data. And then we have to find a suitable subspace such that uh, actually our sigma k sigma admit an inverse. Once we, compose, once we find this space here and this operator is invertible, then we can compose with k sigma. And then this guy here will exactly have these two properties here. So the space where uh, this operator is actually invertible and is well defined is in the kernel of K sigma Decker. So basically, we can apply the on this space here, and that's because uh, also the range of K the range of K sigma is exactly the kernel of the sigma, as you may see immediately. So if you just plug, uh, for example, k in from, uh, on the right, 
then you get a, a simplification and you are left up with the k minus k. So what the benefit of this operator here is actually a projection, so it's square to itself. And uh, on the space of Hodge decomposable initial data, it's just identity. So in particular, it is also preserving uh, the kernel of the sigma dagger. Computing this operator here is not easy, it's a quite long computation and depends how k sigma is, uh, is achieved, uh, how is it defined. But uh, super surprisingly enough, uh, this just reduces to the following easy operator, where uh, this is are just uh, the zero operators because it has to kill the zero component of the initial data. And then we end up with some uh, operator pi that, uh, as you can see, is just a projection operator because it's square to itself and uh, map any function, any, any one form to something that is divergence free. So it's really projecting uh, in this subspace here. Okay, now that we have uh, the sigma, we have all the ingredients to construct the Adamant state. So by standard deformation argument, we can assume the manifold mg to be ultrastatic, so namely the h of t, the, the Riemannian metric h does not depend on t, and also of bounded geometry. So since we are in this setting here, we can also use some pseudo differential calculus and also spectral calculus as a Christian and Mika has done, and, <clears throat> and we can construct a square root of the Hodge Laplacian operator, delta, delta zero and delta high. And uh, what is actually nice and can be seen is that uh, the square root of this operator here commute up to a smoothing operator or a smooth kernel, an operator with a smooth kernel with uh, the projection uh, pi. Then we can define two pseudo, two, uh, pseudo differential projection, pi plus and pi minus, just as uh, for uh, any scalar theory. So you just take, uh, since you do com we have the composite Maxwell field in a, time co in a scalar component, we just uh, construct the usual projection that gives rise to some other state. And uh, similarly also to the component for a sigma, and uh, what is nice is that uh, this, uh, the square root of this uh, Hodge Laplacian provides also some uh, micro local factorization of the, of the wave operator, the I, always modulo smoothing, but anyway, the wave front, the wave front set is not detected. The, the wave front set of a smoothing operator is just empty. And uh, given this micro local uh, characterization, uh, micro local splitting, uh, diagonalization, so what we can see is that the composition between the Cauchy evolution operator and this uh, pi plus minus satisfies exa exactly this Adamar condition. So up to this point here, we can say that this uh, pi, plus, pi plus and minus define some uh, Adamar projector on the space uh, of Hodge decomposable Cauchy data in the radiation gauge. But now we would like to pull back along uh, T sigma. And to this end, we just have to pair the projection operator pi sigma plus and minus with the, the projection operator or the operator t sigma from the left, from the right, and from the left. And what we can notice is that they actually satisfied all the requirements that uh, will give some uh, pseudo covariances of an Adamar quasi free state. So, they will be again uh, uh, self adjoint with to respect the symplectic form uh, on the space of all of uh, the space of initial data, not just the one of watch decomposable. They will preserve again uh, gauge transformation and uh, they will respect again the canonical commutation relation up, of course, to some uh, gauge transformation. They will be positive uh, in the kernel uh, of k sigma dagger, and they will satisfy the Adamar condition. So, in the in the last minutes, just let, let me just give uh, a sketch how these uh, four properties here are proved, and then we can apply the result of uh, Christian and Mikau to conclude that actually 
these, oper these operators here provide exactly the, so the covariances you are looking for. So to prove one, we just start to notice that uh, the operator, the square root of the Laplacian, are actually formally self-adjoint with to respect also the Hodge inner product. And therefore, uh, the operator pi that is constructed out of them is also formally self-adjoint with to respect uh, the, same, uh, the same charge. So this sigma should be actually a Q1 sort. And then, uh, since also pi are formally self-adjoint, uh, and uh, as direct computation shows that also the sigma is formally self-adjoint, uh, we can conclude that also C plus and minus are formally self-adjoint. So this is, is the first step. And then uh, uh, for the second step, uh, we started to notice that uh, these two pl P plus and minus were actually Adamar projection, so they sum to the identity. So when we just consider C plus and C minus, then this just reduces uh, to get T sigma P plus plus P minus, that is the identity, to T sigma. So we get T sigma square, that is just a projection operator, so it's again T sigma. But since we are just working modulo a gauge transformation, so we know that the T sigma is a bijection between uh, initial, the phase space and the gauge fixed the initial data, then uh, this is simply, we can choose a representative such that the T sigma is just, of F is simply F. The positivity also follows quite directly by construction because once we plug uh, C sigma, then, then we can use uh, just the definition and the fact that this map here are unitary in this space and this projection operator were positive definite. Last but not least, we know that uh, by construction, actually pi sigma that are constructed with D, delta, and epsilon commute uh, with this uh, operator T sigma just up to smoothing. And therefore, uh, since a uh, pi plus and minus satisfy the Adamer condition, then commuting pi, pi with T sigma, we know that also C plus minus satisfy the Adamer conditions. So this is uh, the end of the story. So maybe just a quick recap. So we have seen that uh, for Maxwell theory, actually fixing completely the gauge decrease of freedom is useful to get positivity and the gauge invariance, but uh, already for Maxwell, the, pay, the price to pay is reducing the space uh, of classical observable as soon as, the as soon as the Cauchy surface is not compact. Furthermore, for a generic manifold, uh, the construction of Adamar projection given by Christian and Mikau it can be done, but it's not clear that they will commute uh, with the operator that fix completely gauge freedom, even uh, modulo smoothing, a smoothing operator. So one has to, to, to rearrange a better construction in such a way that uh, also there will be also some uh, commutation uh, up to smoothing with the gauge fixing operator T sigma. Or differently, one might try to look for different gauge fixing T sigma such that uh, they are going to to impose positivity and also to preserve the Adamar, the Adamar condition of the projector. While we have uh, considered Maxwell, where uh, actually a lot of something has already been written by, for example, Felix Finster and Alexander Stromayer, where they work Maxwell theory in the Gupta Bloyer, or by Christian and Mika, where they work with linear ICM and Mills, that's because we want uh, a toy model for actually discussing linearized gravity, where the problem are uh, quite, uh, quite tough. I mean, in linearized gravity, you are no longer working with uh, one forms, but two tensor, and that does not make life nicer. And controlling both positivity and gauge invariance is a really difficult task. So the idea is that uh, uh, to reply the same strategy of this gauge fixing, but differently from Maxwell, the, pos the possible gauge that give positivity are not so obvious, and there are many gauges that uh, one can actually look for. For example, there are the synchronous, the redonder, and the traceless gauge. 
And of course, in fixing all post all this three gauge in once, uh, will, uh, in order to fix it at the level of Cauchy data, there will be some reduction because it, we will not expect that this can be achieved in complete generality. Second, the construction of T sigma actually was quite challenging for Maxwell, and again, from linearized gravity, it might be not so easy, but still uh, doable. And uh, last but not least, since we don't have a deformation argument for linearized gravity, we really have to modify the construction of T sigma, pi sigma, such that the operator C plus minus satisfies the Adama condition, or even looking for a better gauge fix in T sigma, such that uh, it's going to commute with the usual Adamar projection. So that's everything I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention.